Many years ago, I served in the, in the bank. And at one time, I was at uh, the branch at Tuong, which is a, a suburb of the city of Brisbane. From time to time on Friday afternoons, there would be a disturbance uh, often in the street as a large group of students would walk from the neighbouring University of St Lucia to protest some issue. After holding up traffic and confronting the police, they would then retreat to the local pub for a beer. They were often reported in the media uh, and they were usually labelled the radical element, seeking to bring some change to whatever they thought was inappropriate or unjust. It was not necessarily the same issue each time they marched. Radicals do not want incremental change. They want dramatic change, and it usually is something that will challenge the status quo of the day. The dictionary describes a radical as a person who advocates fundamental political, economic, and social reforms by direct and often uncompromising methods. I would tell you today, Jesus fits the bill. I believe Jesus is the greatest radical to ever walk this planet. He advocated that his followers pray for those who persecute them and actually love their enemies. He said the first will be last and the last will be first. In other words, he said, don't push to the front of the line. He said, turn the other cheek when people challenge you, often unjustly. Rather than carry bitterness and hate towards others who have hurt you, he said, you learn to forgive. And when a despised Roman soldier rudely interrupts your day to demand that you carry his pack weighing about 30 kilos for a mile, which they were allowed to do, he said, do it cheerfully, and when you get to reach the end of the mark, offer it to carry another mile for him, although your schedule has now been obviously thrown into chaos. So this morning, we would look at what was Christ's radical approach to leadership, found in Mark chapter 10 and verses 35 to 45, as we read. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to know to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do? He replied. And they said, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptized, baptism I am baptized with? We can, they, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The servant attitude portrayed and promoted by Christ grates against the natural instinct of many of us today, and particularly with people with leadership aspirations. James and John came forward with a bold request. Lord, when you get to glory, we'd like to be on your right and on your left. In other words, we don't want to do the intermediary steps. We want to go right to the top. Jesus replied that they never really knew what they were asking. And I, I sense that there were probably a couple of reasons why he said this to them. Firstly, their request went right against the example of servanthood that he wanted to display and was about to explain again. And secondly, at that stage, they never really knew what it would cost for those who would be honoured in the kingdom. When Jesus refers to his baptism in this passage, this was not the water baptism, but it was his baptism of suffering, mistreatment, degrading and false accusations that he had to endure. But he hinted that in time, 
they would come to know these by the pathway that would be before them in following him. Leadership has many faces. Parents, we've been reminded of that in a little way already just this morning, in the home. It is crucial to have leadership in the home for a following generation. Poor leadership in the family has catastrophic results way beyond the walls of the house. Leadership in business. Hopefully in your working life you have encountered some good bosses. But I am sure that if I surveyed you here today that there would be some there who have had to endure some bosses that you don't send Christmas cards to. And in the church. This is the place where these qualities of Jesus should be the most on display. Unfortunately, our human nature still thrives on the bias of self. And we're not always a good example, as we should be, of what Jesus put before us. And I would also say today there is the challenge of modern approach to selecting leaders in our world. Much of it now is on self-promotion. Politicians vie for your vote on the basis that they are the best choice and that's what they tell you. The business world is dominated by self-styled resumes, often written with little or no humility. And Jesus says, in amongst all of this, when they take their position, when they reach their status, when they find their place of ambition and have that authority, they just love to exercise that power over others. And he turns then to those guys around him and I don't know whether he wags the finger at him, but he, I can see him doing it. He says, not so with you. Not so with you. This is a defining moment in the disciples' learning. Because Christ was actually saying that they would come into leadership. They would be uh, instrumental in being influencers of many other people. But he said, the way you're seeing it done around you in the world is not the way it's going to happen in my kingdom. And as I just read that passage again to this last week in the preparation, I felt as though God was putting it in my heart. Not so with you, Keith. And I would share it out to you today. Not so with us. If we are the followers of Jesus Christ, our mantle of leadership does not come from the way of the world. You may see it everywhere around you, but don't let it contaminate your attitudes and standards. I am more and more convinced as followers of Jesus that the leadership we demonstrate, whatever sphere it is that we've been called in, should be radical and transformational to the lives around about. The problem is, of course, as with so much of our growth in the Christian life, it takes time for God to be able to mold us and chip off things that and not the what he wants. And we have to give way for the Holy Spirit to give freedom to change our lives to become as Christ wants us. It can only be very intentional actions by God often towards us, often misunderstood by us at the time, that will mold us in the correct way. Just to reflect for a moment on some of the training that many of the leaders of Scripture went through. Joseph. Lost his family, his security, his heritage when he was sold into slavery as a teenager by his brothers and then falsely imprisoned in Egypt by the seductive wife of his employer. It doesn't look like the pathway to leadership. Moses was a leader in Egypt, had a privileged position. That one of the highest positions and status and he lost that to be confined to looking after sheep for 40 years in the desert. Daniel never got a chance. As a teenager, he was taken as a captive to a foreign land where he didn't know the language or the culture, and he died in that foreign land. John the Baptist gave up any sense of comfort of the day and lived the most simple life. Paul put aside his foundational religion, his high education, and his trust in human intellect, and Christ gave up the status of heaven to kneel amongst us. The result of each of their pathway, Joseph rose to second in Egypt and delivered Egypt and the surrounding countries from the effects of seven years of drought 
And when finally reunited with his devious brothers, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. If we were to ask Jesus, what was great about Joseph? I don't think he'd point to the fact that he got to the status of second in Egypt. I think he would say he was humble and trusting in his attitude towards God. Moses delivered two million people from slavery and was called by Numbers 12 the most humble man on the face of the earth. Daniel served through several foreign kings for a lifetime of distinction without compromise to his God. When thrown into the lion's den, and I used to think when I went to Sunday school that Daniel was a young man in the lion's den. He was probably about 80 years of age. So you pensioners, look out. I'm one. But when the pagan king Darius saw the testimony of Daniel, he said, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. John the Baptist had the privilege after 400 years of silence from heaven, as it were, to bring the message of heaven back to earth to prepare the way for Jesus. Paul became the great missionary to the then known world and the writer of the majority of the New Testament. And Christ, of course, became the supreme one and only legitimate saviour of mankind, the one to whom we turn to and the very reason that we walk through the door today. Some of the things that characterise our pathway of learning as a servant leader is that this, it's not always by choice. It's not always by choice. And often the pressure of circumstances that God seems to allow, it's often difficult at the time to see the reason for this. And the challenge before us is to always believe that even in our darkest moments, God is in control. Second, we need to embrace the journey with God without a victim mentality. Um, I believe this is one of the greatest challenges in our world today. Victim mentality has overcome our society. There must always be someone else to blame, someone else to sue, someone else to take down, someone else to be able to get something out of because I did not deserve where I, to be where I am. As I see it, as the disciples of Jesus, we may and quite possibly will end up in circumstances that are unjust, that we should never have been there, just not fair. And their first response can so easily go to the victim mentality of, I want to get even, I want to do this, I want to do that. When there is something that Jesus is wanting to plant in the heart of his followers that says, no, you do not react that way. You need to look higher to the authority that is in your life. Joseph was in prison, but God was still in control. And no matter what it is in our life today, I encourage each one of us to be able to think and to look to the sovereignty of God upon our lives. This is in stark contrast to the leadership under which the world today would show us. Thirdly, we often need to learn to be a servant. Learning to, as being a servant doesn't always come easily um, in our culture because servants don't complain, they don't stand up for their rights or they don't go on strike, they just obey. And there's a little verse in Hebrews that is a huge challenge in this to all of our lives because it talks about Jesus in Hebrews 5 and verse 8 and it says these words, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And I have difficulty getting my head around that because I thought, what else did Jesus have to learn? He was perfect. But I think this verse is somehow telling us that in the transition from Jesus coming as the, the, the beautiful son of God from eternity and coming in to become a man and to living here, he had to learn some ways that were not common in heaven. He had to learn to be obedient. We often need to learn to be a servant, to learn to follow in that way. Number four, they faithfully and effectively complete the tasks given them. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I may have used this illustration before, but some time ago, early one morning when I 
was down uh, running on the the, uh, the sand uh, before the just before the sun came up, and it was a low tide, and the the sand was just a mass of all you know these little tiny sand balls the crabs make. It looks as though there were thousands, tens of thousands, maybe millions of them, right across the sand. And as I stood there and watched, and a little crab hopped out, and one more popped out, I thought to myself, do you know what? The tide's going to come in. We'll wash all those away. And tomorrow the crabs have to do it again. There's sometimes this about leadership. Leadership following Jesus is not about putting runs on the board, a graph on the wall, or a trophy up there that we can say we got to. Leadership under Jesus is an obedience to what he's asked us to do. It may or may not be on any particular day that we can show a great outcome for what we've done. And it may even seem that something else has come in and just washed it away, and we can think, what's the point in doing this? But just like the crabs, if we're following Christ, we get up the next day, and we again are obedient to what he called us to. My observation is that truly humble men and women who follow Christ in this leadership example are not weak people. They kneel before a child because they know their identity. They put others first because they do not have to prove anything to anyone else. They're often possessed of a steely determination to follow a goal or purpose that they believe they were called to by God. A parent who will not deviate with their values because there's too much at stake if they compromise. A business person who will not compromise their standards and ethics for this sense of expediency. A politician who, if necessary, will stand against the party on a matter of principle. A person who is called to mission who lets nothing stand in their way of reaching their destination. A worker with young people who gets up one more day because today might be the day that one of those young people follow Jesus. A grandparent who refuses to stop praying for their prodigals, no matter how far they seem to be away from Christ. A young person who refuses to be swept along by the unchristian cultures and behaviors of the world. An employee who goes to work one more day to a demanding boss because they want to be the fragrance of Christ in that workplace. They are all leadership situations that Christ can call us into. Jesus is looking today for servanthood in all of us. The humility to bend the knee, the willingness to serve, the patience to put others first, the attitude not to become victims, the determination to finish the task and the conviction if necessary to stand alone. These are the qualities that Jesus is saying are in true leaders. For Jesus still says to you and I today, the one who is least among you, he or she is the greatest. And Jesus still today wants to take you and I on this radical path of leadership. As a radical, he did not hold a demonstration to hold the peak hour traffic up for hours or chant slogans. He humbly went to the cross but his leadership was powerful. He took a ragtag team, team of guys. He transformed them into leaders and he birthed the church, which is the reason that you and I have heard the gospel and it's the very reason that we came today. So the challenge is, if we find ourselves in a leadership role, let's seek to draw the core foundation from the wisdom of Jesus. As we view the leadership models of the world, Jesus would interrupt us again and say, not so with you. Over the years, I've read many good books on Christian leadership. It's been my passion. But the one which remains my go-to outside of the Bible still is the very first one that I read called Spiritual Leadership by Oswald Sanders, a great man of God who's now gone to be with God. In it, he says, if the world is to hear the church's voice today, and he wrote this in 1966, Leaders are needed who are authoritative, spiritual, and sacrificial. Authoritative because people desire leaders who know where they are going and are confident of getting there. Spiritual because without a, 
a strong relationship with God, even the most attractive and competent person cannot lead people to God and sacrifice. Because this follows the model of Jesus who gave himself for the whole world and he calls us to follow in his steps. And then he includes this anonymous poem in his book, which I have drawn from many years. Some of you may have heard it, but it remains with me one of the indications of God's preparation in our life. It says, when God wants to drill a man, and of course it includes women, or thrill a man or skill a man, when God wants to mould a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart, to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed. Watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trials shapes of clay which only God understands. While his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands. How he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes. How he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him, by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. We're reminded as we finish today that in Timothy, when Paul was writing this young man, he said, to aspire to be a leader is a noble purpose. And many people have taken that verse and therefore in their own personal aspiration have said, I want to be a leader. But we need to be reminded the context in which Paul wrote that in Timothy. Paul wrote that at a time when the leaders in the Christian church were the ones being persecuted. Some of them were, were dying for their faith and be the martyrs. And that's why Paul said to Timothy, to aspire to leadership today is a noble cause because you are prepared to be sacrificial for the people that you are leading and those who are following behind you. It had nothing to do with status or ambition. Friends, today, the challenge is upon us, the challenge upon me, upon you in whatever sphere of influence you have, to not model our lives upon what the world will tell us is required to be a successful, charismatic leader and reach certain goals, but to follow Jesus and his example. For he comes to my heart today, and I believe he comes to each one of us, and he says, that might be the way of the world, but not so with you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that Jesus not only spoke words, he modeled them. We thank you, Father, he not only preached, he set an example. Father, he was radical. He upset the standards of the times he was in, and if he walked today, he would do the same. Help us, Lord, today to take on the transformational example of Christ in any sphere of leadership that we find ourselves in. In his name we pray. Amen.